Welcome back to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay, and this is Reality Asserts Itself. We're continuing our discussion with Glenn Ford, evaluating the presidency of JFK on the 50th anniversary of his assassination. Now joining us again is Glenn Ford. He's the executive editor of Black Agenda Report. He the, was the founder and host of America's Black Forum, the first nationally syndicated black news interview show on commercial television. Ford is also the author of The Big Lie, an analysis of U.S. media coverage of the Granada invasion. And I should add, he's a regular contributor to The Real News. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Paul. So part one of this interview is more about domestic issues. And now we're going to pick up a little more on the international front, which obviously preoccupied most of the Kennedy presidency. Um, in terms of the history of JFK and his relationship to the Soviet Union, to national liberation movements, uh, his anti-communism, his... Uh, uh, of course, uh, some people say his preparation, if necessary, for a nuclear war against the Soviet Union, and so on and so on. The theory goes that after the Bay of Pigs, and then you have the Cuban Missile Crisis, when the Soviets uh, put missiles into Cuba, uh, and there's this big confrontation. Kennedy orders a naval blockade of Cuba, and Khrushchev backs down, and the uh, blockade is lifted, but we came as close as most people think we ever did to a, a nuclear war. Anyway, the theory goes that after this, Kennedy changed his approach to foreign policy, and this affected his uh, Vietnam policy, where he decided at that point he was going to try to get out of Vietnam. In other words, Kennedy really did become a kind of dove, a liberal in foreign policy because of coming so close to the brink. Uh, what's your evaluation of Kennedy and his foreign policy? I don't think we see any evidence of a changed Kennedy, possibly a chastened Kennedy after uh, the U.S.-backed forces were beaten at the Bay of Pigs. Uh, that would tend to change somebody's mind about the chances for successfully using uh, U.S. military power or proxy powers abroad. Uh, that doesn't mean uh, that the inclination and the desire uh, to uh, aggressively uh, pursue U.S. power has diminished uh, at, at all. Uh, this is the Kennedy uh, who only weeks before his own assassination uh, arranged the assassination of the South Vietnamese dictator uh, that Eisenhower had backed and that the Kennedys uh, had backed, that is Ziem uh, and his brother, and began uh, the series, the unending series, uh, until 1975 of uh, dictators, uh, military dictators in charge of, of, uh, of South Vietnam. Uh, uh, so I, I fail to see any evidence uh, that uh, Kennedy uh, ceased being uh, the Cold War liberal who would come into uh, office uh, talking about a missile gap, that is saying that the Soviets were ahead of the United States uh, in anti-ballistic uh, missiles when clearly, uh, and we know that the opposite was true, uh, by, by saying that, by raising the missile uh, gap. Uh, uh, issue. Uh, he was calling for an escalation uh, of the uh, of, of the Cold War, uh, of the uh, of the dangerous uh, armed end of the Cold War. So this is this is not a a person who just uh, has a, a an inner an inner peace in itself that's just waiting to bust out. And I see no evidence that it ever did bust out. There seems to be two competing theories, and I don't know if you've kind of studied this, but I'll, I'll ask you. Uh, Chomsky's thesis on this is that Kennedy's I, uh, plan was to, to pull out of Vietnam if there was a victory, but not otherwise, and that in, the, in his first years of presidency, they thought there'd be an early win in Vietnam, which is why there was some suggestion of possible withdrawal. But Chomsky argues it was always based on victory, then withdrawal. Uh, others are, are arguing that there's evidence, uh, and there's, they quote, for example, uh, some private conversations that Kennedy had with people, and these people later said so, but essentially that, that this is unwinnable, and after I get reelected, I can't say anything about this before, because I can't look like a president that's going to lose a war, but once I get reelected, we can get out. Uh, because eventually they're going to throw us out. Uh, uh, this is uh, two very competing theories here. Do you have a sense of this? You know, uh, Kennedy certainly was building up uh, the infrastructure of U.S. aggressive uh, war. Uh, the, the Green Berets, 
are largely, in the modern sense, a creation of the Kennedys. Uh, the U.S. Special Forces had been around uh, since right after World War II, uh, but they weren't backed by a huge publicity uh, campaign as Kennedy uh, introduced. And, and quite clearly, we, we knew this at the time, and certainly we know it in hindsight, uh, that this, this massive uh, expansion of the Green Berets uh, and this propaganda about their purpose uh, was in preparation for U.S. Uh, intervention, a covert and overt in Latin America and, of course, in Southeast Asia. So here we have Kennedy being one of the architects uh, of this new period of U.S. hyper-aggressiveness in the third world. That doesn't sound like the kind of guy who's going to uh, withdraw from Southeast Asia uh, the first time he gets a face-saving big victory. It doesn't make sense to me. In some ways, it occurs to me that because we, we've been working on this for the last week or two, it's somewhat it's somewhat of a distracting debate, I think, whether he planned to get out or didn't get out, because I think in some ways that was a tactical decision. Uh, what I mean by this, this be, has become a big debate because people tie it to assassination theory. That if he, he, the reason he was assassinated is because he planned to get out of Vietnam, and there were sections of the military industrial complex that didn't want that war ended, so they killed Kennedy. Whether that's true or not, uh, who, I don't know, uh, but I, I think what I'm getting at here is if he did plan to get out, it's only because he thought it would weaken the projection of American power as a whole. It, for the same reason Barack Obama opposes the Iraq war, not because he's against projecting global power and being the dominant power of the world, it's because he thought the Iraq war was just a mistake and would actually weaken that dominance. And I think you could say exactly the same thing for Kennedy, that he was very committed, and, and I think very important what you just said, the issue wasn't just about the Soviet Union. Maybe after the, uh, the confrontation of the Cuban Missile Crisis, he's very aware of making sure the world doesn't blow up, but he does not lessen his commitment to opposing national liberation movements all over the world, which in many ways I think were more an issue than the Soviet Union was. And of course, they always used the attack on the Soviet Union as a way to say that national liber liberation movements were just the Soviets taking over the world. But we know from CIA analysts that were, that, that were actually briefing presidents and all this that nobody really believed any of that. So, so I, I guess the real issue is that the, 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 the Kennedy creates this liberal vision of America bringing democracy to the world by supporting dictators everywhere. Yeah, you know, and if we follow uh, the logic here, uh, let's assume uh, that uh, Vietnam was looking like a quagmire uh, that should be escaped from uh, uh, after one face-saving victory. Well, if he still wants to confront uh, the Soviets wherever he can and wherever he can do it efficiently and effectively, well, then we're talking about Vietnam-like aggressions uh, elsewhere, in Latin America, in Africa. If, if, if the Cold Warrior, the Cold War liberal wants a war uh, and he's the head of a superpower, he can find one. Kennedy clearly wanted some wars. He wanted a confrontation. Gore Vidal, who I got to know pretty well, uh, I knew Jack Kennedy quite well, and he was in and out of the White House. For people that don't know, Gore Vidal shared a stepfather with the Jack Kennedy's wife, Jacqueline Kennedy, and so Gore was in those family circles. Uh, and, and, and Gore actually was a very, loved Jack Kennedy as a person, actually. He was very fond of him and, and hated Bobby Kennedy for reasons he never explained to me. But he, he actually said what you just said. Jack Kennedy fully believed to be a historic president, you have to have won a big war, that oh, people only remember wartime presidents. And that was part of what drove Jack. Yes, profiles in courage. Uh, the the persona not just <clears throat> not just of the president but of the american nation uh the crusading national character going up, up against the villain that whole uh, creation of mythology in your own time and and uh, and it's it's effective and that's why we're having some elements of this conversation and i think just to just to go back what i said just a few bit, seconds ago and so did you the, the real threat I, I think and and where the real attention of the united states was was to opposing national liberation movements they didn't want country after country 
becoming independent from the U.S. sphere. And, you know, and most of those national liberation movements were leaning towards socialism. If they achieved their the victories, they would have become probably some form of socialism or another and somehow escaped this American and the global capitalist sphere. It's not that they were going to become, uh, you know, puppets necessarily of the Soviet Union. Far from it. Most of these national liberation movements were having lots of problems with, with, with the Soviet Union and the kind of support they were getting from them. Sure. National liberation movements stem from historical oppressions of, of people. Uh, they are not generated by uh, Soviet folks in faraway uh, Moscow. Uh, the, United, the United States uh, allied itself and, uh, and specifically President Kennedy through his creation of the Green Berets uh, and uh, of the Peace Corps, uh, which was, of course, uh, deeply tied with the CIA. Uh, he was laying the infrastructure uh, for the horror, the continental-wide horror that the U.S. would impose on uh, South America, on Latin America, uh, during the Johnson and Nixon uh, years. Uh, one of the charges against the candidates is they, they stood by while death squads were being organized in Guatemala and other places in Latin America. I shouldn't say stood by. Some say the CIA obviously actively supported. Presidents are responsible for what happens on their, on their watch. Uh, in, in the case of the Kennedys, there's every reason to believe uh, that this, this initiative, uh, this robust foreign policy uh, was a, uh, an, an uninitiative of those, of those two. So when you look at today's presidency and today's U.S. foreign policy, uh, do you see any uh, uh, Kennedy echo of the Kennedy administration? Well, people are trying to synthesize that Camelot feeling and sound, and many thought that they had uh, they found it with uh, President uh, o Obama. I think his his Camelot is wearing a little bit thin, though. All right. Thanks for joining us, Glenn. All right. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.